I'm Rebecca. Um, so I'm a high schooler and like most high schoolers nowadays, I'm on social media a lot. Um, more often than not, while scrolling my explore page of everything ranging from math memes to sports videos, I come across some someone jo joking about depression or anxiety like these. We live in a world where mental illnesses are so prevalent that their casual mention on social media comes regularly. So regularly, in fact, that when we see a joke about depression or anxiety, we barely spare it a thought. And yet, despite this toxic culture, there's still a deep stigma against those suffering or seeking treatment for mental illnesses. I can't speak for the whole country in my personal experiences with mental illnesses, but I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, whose schools are known for their high educational performance. Many of these schools have won awards for academic achievement, like the California Gold Ribbon or the National Blue Ribbon. But what people don't hear about is the high rates of depression and anxiety and of hushed up stories of student suicides. The cost of this seemingly amazing education that every school is striving for hides the ugly reality of students sleeping an average of less than six hours a night, pulling frequent all-nighters and of daily mental breakdowns. Um, summers and weekends for too many students are spent on endless SAT prep, cramming homework, or studying ahead just to pass the next year's classes um, in all hours of the day and the night. In addition, many students with serious depression, anxiety, or other mental disorders are often scoffed at and cannot find the community support or treatment they need. The CDC and National Alliance on Mental Illness state that about half of all Americans are diagnosed with a mental health related issue um, at some point during their life. And out of those people, about 60% don't receive treatment. And um, the reason for that ranges from cost to the stigma against those suffering from mental illnesses. Unfortunately, this means that someone in the United States dies by their own hand every 12 minutes. And with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, these mental disorder statistics are only rising faster. Traditionally, common types of treatment for mental disorders include psychotherapy, also known as talk therapy, medications like antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, and in more severe cases, a monitored stay at a psychiatric hospital. However, with the traditional trial and error methods that are used to combat complex mental illnesses, it can be really difficult to find the right treatment for each specific patient. Um, we can take a closer look at antidepressants, for example. Studies have shown that antidepressants improve symptoms of depression in about another 20 out of 100 people over a placebo, and not to mention the various side effects that can come with taking them. And despite the medication's many benefits for many people, um, it's often not the most effective treatment for others, and it can be really difficult for healthcare workers to determine which will be more effective. Thankfully, with increasing availability and use of technology, we have the potential to combat this problem. So what can artificial intelligence do? Well, AI uses algorithms that can perform tasks um, that would be really costly, either resource-wise or time-wise, by learning from previous experiences um, to develop a new idea for a new output for um, a given input. And the earliest ideas about AI actually came from science fiction stories like um, The Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Fast forward 80 years and we now have self-driving cars, voice assistants, face recognition, and more. And the role of AI as our future is written all over current books and movies, you know, Jarvis, R2D2, Baymax, literally any robot you can think of. Um, studies about the use of AI in the mental health field have been able to collect data ranging from normal hospital admission data to um, brain EEGs to smartphone data. And they use machine learning algorithms to analyze all of these markers. Um, these studies were fairly accurate in predicting the usefulness of a certain medication for patients um, and the probability of developing a certain um, mental disorder before it happens and predicting if someone would develop worse outcomes worse outcomes such as attempting suicide within a certain amount of time. 
studies involving artificial intelligence are, for the most part, still very recent studies in a quickly expanding field. And more studies such as these ones are necessary to give us more data and information um, to be able to compare the effects of different treatments and to carry across to the treatments of other mental disorders. But such improvements on the current methods used to determine a personalized treatment for a mental disorder can make the recovery process more effective and more efficient and thus a lot more accessible. Some of you may know of apps that can help with depression or other mental disorders. Often um, these are ones where you enter in your daily mood um, and it gives you advice such as a reminder to take a medication or um, to consult a mental health professional. The great part about these apps is that they're easily accessible on any device, um, anywhere, at any time. Um, they're free or inexpensive and they can be used anonymously for anyone who faces the stigma that unfortunately can come with having a mental health disorder. Um, think back at the extraordinarily high statistics concerning mental illness um, at some point in a person's life and the sad, sadly low number of people who actually receive proper treatment. And imagine the difference it would make if artificial intelligence and the technology um, already surrounding us could make diagnosis and treatment of mental illnesses easily accessible and destigmatized. So imagine there's this high school student, um, we can call him David. Um, like most teenagers, he normally has his phone or a laptop near him, or he's wearing a smartwatch. Um, he's a good student, he takes difficult classes, he's a track athlete, and several, he has several other extracurriculars, you know, basically an uh, all around high achieving student. Um, which means frequent high stress levels. The year is 2025, a few years from where we are now. It's the Monday of finals week. So David wakes up to a 6 a.m. alarm, followed by a greeting by the voice assistant on his phone, Daisy, which for the purposes of the story stands for a daily artificial intelligence system for you. In keeping with the high school student job description of being a master procrastinator, David stayed up late last night um, doing a math review packet in preparation for his first final and only got about four hours of sleep. He groans and lies in bed staring at the ceiling for five minutes. In fact, the smartwatch he wears has noted that he has had an odd sleep schedule for the last two weeks. Daisy asks him, how was your sleep? And David replies with a moody, fine. He picks up his phone and goes to put his school things in his backpack at which sensors in his watch pick up his in quickly increasing heart rate um, 80 beats per minute despite the fact that he's standing still and he's an athlete. Um, at 7.15 he slings his backpack across his shoulder and goes outside slamming the door shut and waits for his friend who he carpools with to arrive. His phone's GPS and movement detection sensors catch that he's been pacing, um, pacing around ever since he woke up with an elevated heart rate, unusually rapid breathing, and um, he barely ate breakfast. Also, when he texted a friend, um, he was misspelling practically every word, relying on autocorrect, typing slower than usual with lots of backspaces and second guessing himself in just like a normal conversation. As David paces on the sidewalk in front of his house, Daisy has taken the morning's data and factored in a year from the last two weeks, such as skipping preseason track practice several times to conclude that something's wrong. Um, she has an idea that it is anxiety based on years of David's behavior that she has compiled and learned from and knows how to talk to him in this situation. And she gives him a motivational spiel during which his watch tracks the lowering heart rate and more regular breathing pattern. Um, and she also starts playing music from a personalized playlist of his most listened to songs. So in this story example, these kinds of personalized interventions helped calm David down before his anxiety became worse and prevent an anxiety attack. And of course, these kinds of mini interventions that are more realistic for the near future can't fully replace um, the work of real human interactions like a therapist yet. Um, however, virtual assistance and existing technology could be used to approach all of these da um, daily situations, particularly for the 60% of people suffering from mental disorders who don't receive treatment. In addition, they would be able to use more personal variables um, that might be considered trivial or difficult to factor in by a human therapist to enter into an algorithm that can process data more rapidly than a human can and track a longer period, time period for more accurate statistics than a human report. 
eventually, if this was in wide use and a user were to be referred to a human therapist by a virtual assistant, the data and any conclusions made by the AI algorithms could also be relayed to the therapist. Um, of course, such advancements would require much thought about where data is stored, how it's used, and other privacy concerns. But from the technological side, this could be an amazing advancement for mental health care. Um, these kinds of simple artificial intelligence-based interactions that take advantage of already widespread technological use could improve existing treatments, bring mental health care to more people, and destigmatize the use of mental health resources. Thank you.